Hello and welcome to this episode of Live with Lizzie Lee. Edge is a comprehensive database of Chinese companies for investors and due diligence researchers. I am your host, Lizzie. Joining me today is Professor Chris Miller, author of a new book, Chip War, The Fight for the World's Most Critical Technology. The book provides a fascinating historical account of the birth and development of semiconductors. The book has also been shortlisted by the Financial Times as one of the top business books of the year. Make sure to check it out. Uh, congratulations, Professor Miller, and thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you for having me, Lizzie. So, Professor Miller, first thing first, can you give me a short uh, overview of how computer chips have shaped the landscape of international politics since their invention. And why is the semiconductor called the new oil? Well, if you look at the origins of computer chips, they emerged out of defense industrial needs during the Cold War. The first order for computer chips was the guidance computer in the Apollo spacecraft in the United States. The second major order for computer chips was for the guidance computer and an intercontinental ballistic missile that was designed to deliver warheads uh, to the Soviet Union. And so there's been a really deep interconnection between the rise of the semiconductor industry uh, and military systems uh, from that earliest uh, origins of the industry all the way up to the present. But in addition to the ties to military goods, there's also uh, geopolitical influence that countries have tried to wield by taking advantage of their position in semiconductor supply chains because the chip industry is very concentrated uh, in a number of key firms and in a small number of countries. And so those countries have often sought to use that concentration as a means of applying political pressure on their rivals. And so in addition to the military uses, we also see countries uh, trying to uh, cut off rivals from accessing certain types of technology. Right. And in one chapter of your book, you actually document uh, the semiconductor trade war between the United States and Japan in 1960s and uh, 1970s and 80s. So what are the main takeaways from that episode for U.S. policymakers for today? What worked in terms of policy and what didn't? Well, the Japanese case is interesting in terms of thinking about the president for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that although it's true in the 1970s and 1980s that Japan dramatically increased its market share when it came to producing chips. A lot of the production in Japan actually ended up being non-profitable. And in the 1990s, Japan's market share fell off almost as fast as it had risen a decade previously. So uh, it's worth remembering, I think, that massive capital investment programs in the chip industry can always win market share, but they can't always produce advanced technology or, or profitable firms. And I think when you look at the investment underway in China right now, uh, which is uh, state-backed and which is causing uh, such controversy with China's trading partners, a, a real open question is whether this investment will actually improve technological capabilities in China or not, and whether it will create profitable companies or not. And the example of Japan suggests some reason for caution and skepticism. Um, but the from the U.S. response to the Japanese uh, rise in the 1970s and 80s are also lessons, I think, to be learned. The U.S. tried to respond to Japan um, by threatening to impose tariffs on Japanese ship exports, and this had no appreciable effect on uh, Japanese shipmakers, and if anything, it made the U.S. tech sector worse off. So it doesn't seem like tariffs were an effective response to that at the time. And what actually worked was having U.S. firms invent better and more uh, useful types of technology. And one of the I think key takeaways from the 1980s was that the Japanese were dramatically expanding their market share in semiconductors, but they were doing so with a type of chip that was set to become less important, whereas a small number of startups in the United States invested in new types of technology uh, that eventually set the stage for uh, the, the personal computer revolution, which uh, let the U.S. again jump ahead of uh, Japan. So the key lesson here, I think, is that innovation is always going to be more important than any sort of restrictive strategy or uh, trade strategy in determining uh, which companies and which countries are at the top of the industry. Right. And thinking of contemporary politics, you know, the CHIP Act encourages domestic production, but whether domestic production equals domestic innovation, that's a different matter. Um, I want to turn to Taiwan, which is at the center of the geopolitical tension surrounding the semiconductor industry. Uh, can you talk a little more about Taiwan's chip industry development? What is Taiwan's secret sauce? Why is TMM, uh, TSMC so successful? 
Well, I, I think you're right to focus on TSMC. And I, I would say that Taiwan doesn't really have a special sauce. TSMC has a special sauce because it's TSMC that really towers above the rest of the Taiwanese ship industry. Uh, and it's one of the most valuable publicly traded companies uh, in the world, uh, precisely because it's got unique capabilities that no one else in Taiwan and hardly anyone else in the rest of the world can match. Uh, since TSMC was founded in 1987, it has focused relentlessly on improving its technology. And it's also focused on deeply integrating itself uh, with the rest of the semiconductor supply chain. It's served customers uh, that want TSMC to manufacture uh, their chips uh, from the earliest days and attracted some very large uh, customers, predominantly but not exclusively in the United States uh, from um, the, the founding of TSMC up to the present. And as a result of its expansion over the time and its growing uh, scale, uh, TSMC has established itself as really the center of the processor chip ecosystem, such that today anyone producing a machine tool for uh, chip making or uh, devising software for chip making has to consider what does TSMC want, because TSMC is for many companies their biggest customer. Uh, and that has uh, provided an extraordinary platform for uh, TSMC to grow and to further develop its technology, pouring money into R&D, uh, pouring money uh, into expansions and shipping capacity, such that today its technology is unparalleled and it's got a uh, really unparalleled capacity to produce as well. It makes it, I think, the most important chip company in the entire world. I see. So you briefly alluded to uh, China's industry policy, industrial policy here. I wonder if you can elaborate a little more. Have those massive subsidies been successful in helping China develop its domestic chip industry? If not, what are the reasons? It depends, I think, on how you define success. Um, there's no doubt that there are more Chinese chip companies uh, working at more parts of the supply chain, producing more capacity in part because of the subsidies. That's, I think, pretty clear. What's less clear is whether the subsidies have made an appreciable difference in terms of the level of technology at the cutting edge. And here, I think the track record is mixed, I would say. Uh, there are uh, certain Chinese chip firms that have gotten close to the cutting edge. Uh, SMIC, for example, the biggest uh, Chinese foundry is, is relatively close to the cutting edge. Um, Huawei's chip design arm, High Silicon, um, before the export controls were imposed on it, was fairly cutting edge. Um, and then YMTC, the biggest Chinese NAND memory company, is getting quite close, it seems, to the cutting edge. So there are some success stories. There's also a lot of uh, a lot of uh, data points that suggest waste and uh, misspending of the, the subsidy funds, um, whether it's outright scams or just companies that failed to produce the technology that they promised. So in terms of technological development, I think there are questions to be asked about the efficacy of subsidies. In terms of expanding capacity, though, there's no doubt that subsidies work if capacity expansion is your goal. And as a result of that, China is going to play a much larger role in the chip industry globally in 10 years time uh, compared to what it does today, simply because it's going to have a lot more chip making capacity, uh, especially when we're, we're talking about low, uh, low end, uh, lower technology chips. Right. In the book, uh, you have a chapter illustrating Huawei's example and how American tech dominance can be leveraged against a geopolitical rival, in this case, China. So in practical terms, can China realistically wean itself off core American technology in the future? And how long will that process take for China to diversify away or produce away from U.S. chokeholds in semiconductors? Well, China is, is certainly trying to reduce its dependence on U.S. technology, but it's very, very difficult to completely wean itself off U.S. technology. And there's not, um, it depends on where exactly you look in the chip industry. Certain parts of the chip industry are more dependent than others on U.S. technology, but I'd say in aggregate, um, the U.S. role in the chip industry is really quite large, and the U.S. has control of a number of you know, really important choke points that uh, give the U.S. a lot of power to um, really obstruct advances in China uh, if it wants to. Now, the fact that China's got one of the world's largest market for semiconductors is an important advantage that China has, and the fact that the government's pouring money into the chip industry um, does provide the conditions for China to make some leaps forward in terms of technological capabilities. But I would say from the perspective of today, it's difficult to see any country, uh, China included, uh, being successful at making uh, self-sufficient uh, chips or, or, or non-American um, uh, chips in the foreseeable future. In the longer run, of course, who knows? But right now, it's just basically very difficult to, to make advanced chips without U.S. technology. 
If you enjoy our discussions here, I'm sure you would find value in our new powerful marketplace tool for investors, also called China Edge. It tracks, distills, and analyzes both Chinese language and English language materials about Chinese companies, business leaders, and government entities, and reviews the often hidden links between them. For our YouTube viewers, we are offering a limited time 50% discount. Just go to the link you see on the screen and use the code EDGE50. Also, sign up for the China Edge newsletter. It's a daily two-minute rundown of China business news you don't want to miss. The link is right here on the screen. You can also click on the link in the video's description section to get your complimentary subscription today.